In June of 1981, reports came out of five otherwise healthy gay men in Los Angeles who had come down with PCP, a type of pneumonia typically caused by a suppressed immune system. Doctors and scientists were baffled by the novel disease. They had no idea what was causing these otherwise young, healthy men to become gravely ill. One such scientist who took an interest in researching the novel disease was Anthony Fauci. At the time, the first reports of the illness, Fauci was working his way up in the bureaucracy of the NIH. At the time, Fauci was working on other things, but he was so intrigued by the novel disease that he began dedicating much of his time to it. In 1984, Anthony Fauci was named the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, a title he still holds to this day. And public panic regarding AIDS, which had finally been given a name the year before, had firmly taken over the nation. Public panic intensified, partly because of comments made by Fauci regarding transmission of the virus. In the early 80s, the public believed AIDS was a sexually transmitted disease that only affected gay men. But after the discovery of an infant being diagnosed with the virus, Fauci made comments in the Journal of the American Medical Association claiming the possibility that routine close contact, as within a family household, could spread the disease. This news immediately set off alarm bells as mainstream news outlets such as AP and The New York Times began re reporting on household transmission of AIDS. ABC News sat down with Fauci regarding this new alarming development. Given the the long incubation period of this disease, we may be starting to see, as we're seeing virtually as the months go by, other groups that can be involved. And, and seeing it in children is really quite disturbing. When you say other close contact, give me some examples. Well, for example, if, if the close contact of a child is a household contact, perhaps there will be a certain number of cases of individuals who are just living with and in close contact with someone with AIDS or at risk of AIDS who does not necessarily have to have uh, intimate sexual contact or share a needle, but just the ordinary close contact that one sees in normal interpersonal relationships. Now, that's, that may be far-fetched in the sense that that there have been no cases recognized as yet in which individuals have had merely casual contact, close or uh, albeit, with an individual with AIDS who, for example, have gotten AIDS. For example, there have been no uh, cases yet reported of hospital personnel who have fairly close contact with patients with AIDS. There have been no case reports of them uh, getting AIDS. But but the, the, the jury is still out on that because the situation is, is constantly evolving and the incubation period is such is so long. As you know, it's a mean of about 14 months, ranging from uh, 6 to 18 months. So what medical researchers and public health service officials will be con are concerned with is, the, is the, what we felt were the confines of transmissibility now going to be loosening up and broadening up so that something less than truly intimate contact can give uh, transmission of this disease. Well, of course, we now know that the infant contracted the virus through their mother's womb, but the damage had been done. Public panic had intensified, and people were fearing they could get AIDS from sharing a toilet seat or even from shaking hands. People living with AIDS were being alienated and ostracized from their jobs, homes, communities, and gay men in particular were heavily stigmatized. On the treatment front, Fauci and the team of scientists at the NIH began frantically working on a vaccine, believing that would be the way to end the AIDS epidemic. Confident in their work, Health and Human Services Secretary Margaret, Margaret Heckler declared in 1984 that an AIDS vaccine would be ready for testing within two years. 
But banking on a vaccine proved to be harder than it seemed. Two years passed and there wasn't one even ready for testing. The public was losing patience. Pharmaceutical companies were also racing towards a treatment for AIDS, realizing the incredible potential for profits. In 1987, one such company was Burroughs Welcome, a British drug company who showed in a test tube that their failed cancer drug, AZT, could be repurposed to treat AIDS. Limited studies were done, long-term side effects were unknown, but in record speed, in less than four months, the FDA approved the drug as a treatment, claiming the benefits outweigh the risks. One of the parameters of the speedy approval process was for the drug company to bring back follow-up data in two years. Burroughs Welcome agreed, but of course, since the drug was already approved, they never really needed to follow up, and so they didn't. Celia Farber did incredible, incredible reporting on the approval, use, and dangers of AZT for Spin Magazine in the late 80s in her article titled, Sins of Omission. She writes, quote, the majority of those in the AIDS-afflicted and medical communities held the drug up as the first breakthrough on AIDS. For better or worse, AZT had been approved faster than any drug in FDA history, and activists considered it a victory. The price paid for the victory, however, was that almost all government drug trials from then on focused on AZT, while other over while over 100 other promising drugs were left uninvestigated. Now, the expensive drug made Burroughs welcome record profits, and at the time, it was the most expensive drug ever marketed. But people were desperate. They would do anything to get their lives back. Despite numerous doctors raising concerns about the toxicity of the drug, some even saying that it was doing the very opposite of what it claimed to do, that is, it was actually shortening the lives of their patients, Fauci and other health officials disagreed. In 1989, Fauci began to promote the drug, not only for critically ill AIDS patients, but for anyone who tested positive for HIV, including those asymptomatic who showed no signs of disease. Those patients included hospital workers, pregnant women, and even children. Doctors were stunned. The data the NIH released was limited, but nonetheless, the NIH had gone all in on AZT. Despite it becoming clearer and clearer that AZT was toxic, caused liver damage, and destroyed white blood cells, the drug continued to be used for several years after, while calls from activists and doctors to study any other possible treatments went ignored. One such treatment that was ignored was Bactrim. PCP was the leading killer in AIDS patients, and many doctors were prescribing the inexpensive antibiotic as a prophylaxis for a prevent, to prevent AIDS victims from developing the rare pneumonia. There was evidence that the antibiotic should be used as a prophylaxis whenever the reoccurrence rate of PCP for a given condition was over 15%. The reoccurrence rate of PCP in HIV-positive patients was over 60 percent. Despite the science, Dr. Fauci declined to conduct a clinical trial. Doctors and advocates continued to push for its use, and finally, a couple years, years later, it was adopted, after thousands of patients had already died. As Fauci and the NIH focused on vaccines and AZT for the treatment of AIDS, hundreds of drugs went unstudied, many of which were demonized. In fact, the movie Dallas Buyers Club is about treatments AIDS patients desperately sought after because of the inability to access them legally. Many doctors advocated that the best way to treat patients was to focus on mitigating the severity of the ailments that would ultimately kill them rather than trying to eradicate AIDS altogether, that the virus mutates too quickly to waste all resources and time on a vaccine or other preventatives, that everything should be studied, all avenues explored, and all options should remain on the table. But unfortunately, that's not exactly how the AIDS epidemic was handled. Big Pharma got their payday in AZT. Millions of dollars allocated by Congress went to vaccine research, which never produced anything effective. And meanwhile, along the way, hundreds of drugs and treatment options went unexplored. And we still don't have a cure for HIV. The epidemic never went away like people hoped. We do, however, have effective treatments that help people live a good long life with the virus. There were a lot of mistakes made along the way, a lot of lessons that could have been learned. But after looking into the history of the AIDS epidemic, it's curious if we've actually learned any. 
Here we are today with a pandemic that is causing mass hysteria, like the days of people demonizing gay men as the culprits behind the epidemic. We have the media demonizing the unvaccinated as the root cause for why this virus just won't go away. Many hope the vaccine would stop the spread and eradicate the virus, but like AIDS, the virus seems to mutate too quickly. The same way Fauci discouraged and even pre prevented inexpensive treatments from being talked about, researched and prescribed back then is the same thing that is happening today. And in the end, with the lack of a promising cure and a realization that the virus is likely here with us to stay, many who fear exposure to HIV have chosen to wear a condom to protect themselves, just like those who fear exposure to COVID are choosing to wear a mask. In reality, our government officials should be working on absolutely everything from every angle to attack this virus, from vaccine developments and PPE gear to treatments, protocols, vitamins, health routines, and repurposing other drugs. They should be using our tax dollars to study inexpensive treatments that Big Pharma has zero interest in studying because they can't make billions off of them. And yes, Big Pharma should also continue to try and find a cure or a vaccine. Everything should be tried. Nothing should be spared. Nothing should be demonized. Everything should be studied. But just like what happened during the AIDS epidemic, that just doesn't seem to be happening. Well, Glenn Beck was on Tucker Carlson's show last week, touting what has been called a right-wing conspiracy theory and discussing his new book, The Great Reset, Joe Biden and the Rise of 21st Century Fascism. It explains why the schools are tracking uh, with the DOJ, why Fauci with the vaccine mandates, why Fauci is uh, hiding uh, his relationship with big pharmaceutical, our gas prices, the First Amendment rights, the January 6th uh, people uh, being uh, set up by the FBI. All of this, Tucker, this is the most important book I have read. This is the most important, or that I've written, this is the most important topic of my career, and I think this is the most important topic in the world today. The Great Reset is not a conspiracy theory. It is something that the Davos people have put together along with the World Economic Forum. Okay, well, maybe that all sounds a little bit loony, and believe me, I do think Glenn Beck tends to be a loon, but maybe this isn't such a crazy conspiracy theory after all. And after seeing everything we've seen with the governments enacting all sorts of authoritarian controls and many other conspiracy theories coming true, maybe there's something to be concerned about. So what is the Great Reset? The name even sounds conspiratorial, but believe it or not, it's a real thing. The Great Reset started off as the name of a meeting held by the World Economic Forum in the summer of 2020. The World Economic Forum began in the 70s. It's basically a club made up of world leaders, corporations, and other wealthy elites. Every year, they get together in Davos, Switzerland, and pontificate about how to best manage the world and solve problems. This year, the meeting starts today. However, due to the pandemic, like last year, the winter in-person Davos meeting has been postponed to summer, and instead they'll be hosting the meetings this week online. And the conference kicks off today with a special opening speech by China's Xi Jinping. But basically, think of it as a bunch of hoity-toities getting together in a bougie ski resort town to make connections, rub elbows, collaborate. Sometimes world leaders make some peace and prevent war, which is a good thing. Sometimes people will fundraise money for causes, which is also a good thing. But mostly it's a way for elites and world leaders to get together and scheme up new ways to march us towards a more globalized world. Ideas like NAFTA were born in Davos at their annual meeting. Now, the Great Reset is the name of one of those meetings, and it's since turned into an entire agenda with its own microsite attached to the main World Economic Forum website. And the founder of the World Economic Forum has even written a book titled The Great Reset. So it's very real. Now, the idea is the COVID pandemic has been so disruptive, it's exposed social, political, and economic weaknesses in the Western world. They claim COVID exposed breakdowns in a variety of sectors from healthcare to education to finance to energy. They claim Western capitalism is the root cause of these issues and a serious overhaul a reset of the system is needed. Never mind the fact that most of the disruption was actually caused by governments shutting down businesses, societies, and schools, and now going a step further and telling people they must be vaccinated numerous times over in order to participate in economic, in the economy and society. Governments, no matter what their intentions have been, whether you think it's good or bad, they are the reason for the disruptions. But the Great Reset says either way, it's an opportunity. 
an opportunity to rebuild society in a way the global elites see best fit. Now, one thing that really stands out is that they're very vague about what this reset means or even looks like. They just insist it will be good for us. And because the reset blatantly blames Western capitalism, we see a lot of right-wing outlets such as Fox News and Breitbart going after the Great Reset, claiming it's ushering in socialism or communism. But as Glenn Beck mentioned later on in his interview with Tucker, he says he was wrong, that it wasn't about socialism or communism, that it's more about enacting a form of government similar to China's. And what does that mean exactly if it doesn't mean communism? Well, it means that you would own nothing. Everything would be owned by, most likely, one of the many World Economic Forum partner corporations, and you would have no privacy. Take a look at this video published in 2016 on the World Economic Forum's Facebook page. That you'll own nothing and you will be happy. That's what they're saying. With inflation sky high and no signs of it slowing down, they might be right. We are on our way to becoming a nation of renters. But don't worry, it's nothing to fear. Just the opposite, says Bloomberg, if you remember this story. Bloomberg, by the way, is one of the hundreds of partners with the World Economic Forum. And they list all of their partners on their website. Other partners include NBC, Google, New York Times, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Apple, Amazon, Goldman Sachs, and many, many others. On top of the idea we're just going to have to move towards the sharing economy, the elites have discussed eradicating paper money, making all transactions traceable. We've talked about the proposed plan for the IRS to audit all bank accounts with accumulation of $600 in annual deposits. Well, they've used the fear of global and domestic terrorism to justify and even make popular things like surveillance and censorship. They're limiting our ability to work, get an education, travel, and even enjoy life on the premise of bringing us safety. They're turning us against one another, vaccinating versus unvaccinated, right versus left, getting us to ban and cancel one another, ushering in a sort of organic social credit system. And my guess is many people would welcome a big tech or government controlled social credit scoring system in the same vein as what has been rolled out in China. This would ensure they are only sharing restaurants and movie theaters with other do-gooders like themselves. But don't worry, everything is being done under the premise that this is all good for our own, this is all being done for our own good, the benefit of a collective society, and we will be happy. Right now, everywhere we look, people have COVID. Vaccinated or not, everyone seems to be catching the virus with a whopping 800,000 new cases per day. Because Omicron is spreading like wildfire throughout the country, indiscriminately infecting anyone it comes into contact with, some serious, serious failings by our public health officials, the CDC, Fauci, our politicians, and the mainstream media are becoming glaringly obvious, to the point where I think their failings rise to the level of crimes against humanity. The scientists and health experts Experts. The people responsible for guiding us safely and scientifically through this pandemic have been hyper-focused on vaccines. They raced towards a vax, told us to hunker down and wait for the vax. When it became available, they told us to get the vax. Then all the discussion centered around the awful people who refused the vax. So then they mandated the vax. And throughout this entire time, which is now at two years in, they've never focused on, and often, which is why it rises to the level of a crime, even shut down discussion surrounding the well-known scientific principle of natural immunity. They they shut down and even demonize any discussion of potential early treatments, and they failed to give us good instructions on what to do when our loved ones or we ourselves catch COVID. They flat out refused to focus on any of this. They instead swore if we all got the vaccine, the pandemic would end. Well, it didn't end. Everyone is catching COVID. People who got double vax and triple vax and wore double masks and kept their kids out of school and gave up Christmas with family and even worse, gave up being with their loved ones by their side as they breathed their last breaths because because they weren't allowed to be next to them are catching COVID. Everyone is catching COVID. And as people are catching it, they're starting to realize they have no tools left in their toolkit. Somebody tell me, what are you supposed to do when you catch COVID? 
Seriously, can you answer that question? Besides quarantining yourself and wishing you were vaccinated more than you already are, what are you supposed to do? Do you isolate yourself away from your family and fight the virus alone while hoping and praying you don't need to go to the hospital? Because that's what they've left us with. Why don't we know more about natural immunity and how long it lasts? With so many people getting sick, wouldn't it be helpful to know whether or not people who've already recovered can take on the task of caring for their loved ones who are now ill? The Israelis came out with an enormous study showing natural immunity afforded 13 times more protection against reinfection than vaccination. But quickly, the CDC released its own highly flawed study claiming the opposite, that previously infected people were more likely to catch the virus than those vaccinated. Now, wouldn't it be nice to know which study is right? Wouldn't it be nice to know how long natural immunity lasts? Wouldn't it be nice to know if you do get reinfected, whether or not the disease is more or less severe? Signs point towards previous infection being protective to some degree in the least lessening symptoms when reinfected. And what about the natural immunity younger people seem to have? We've known throughout the pandemic that young people often have very mild illness when infected. But again, the mere mention that they maybe should be less afraid of catching the virus was met with fierce resistance. So here we are now, we have people sick and yet young and old and previously infected alike are all equally scared. And now people who are sick in bed with COVID who can't get themselves water or Tylenol or food to eat are reliant on the brave in their families to care for them if they're lucky enough to have someone brave at all. COVID can often be so debilitating, people can't get themselves out of bed for even the most basic of needs. Frightened people who otherwise maybe wouldn't need to be frightened because they're younger or previously infected are hiding away and leaving food on doorsteps for loved ones, especially expecting them to crawl out of bed and care for themselves. And often people don't get the care they need until they've gotten so bad they need hospitalization. Why don't we have more info on who is perhaps safest to care for others in the family? If you can't get water to stay hydrated, Tylenol to get your temperature down, someone to run a humidifier or to get you food, how can you successfully fight off a virus? I suspect many people didn't get the early care they needed because people were too frightened to be around them and they wound up in the hospital or even worse. And speaking of early treatment, again, no honest discussion or research has been earnestly put into trying to determine what could give a person a better fighting chance. Many early treatments that maybe weren't 100% effective, but reduced severe outcomes by 30% or 40% or 50%, which is better than nothing, were demonized as conspiracy theories before anyone put any real effort into studying them. I can guarantee you right now that anyone sick in bed with COVID will take a treatment that gives them even a 10% better chance of reducing symptoms than nothing at all. But that's pretty much what we've been left with. Nothing at all. Even monoclonal antibodies, a treatment that seemed to work, has been suppressed in the vaccine or bust movement. Yeah, here we are. People are fully vaccinated, even boosted, sick in bed, scared. And the best weapon our public health officials have given them against COVID is what? NyQuil? I say this as someone who, for the past two or three weeks, has been surrounded by and caring for people with COVID. Some vaccinated, some boosted, some unvaccinated. It doesn't matter. People are getting sick. I have been taking temperatures, checking oxygen, running humidifiers, and researching online what am I supposed to do, but the information is scarce. No one is giving us any idea of what we're supposed to do besides the frontline COVID-19 critical care alliance. And guess what? They're, of course, demonized. We're left waiting once again for another big pharma Pfizer solution, the early treatment pill, which does no one any good right now because we're waiting for it. This is what they've left us with. Millions of people are getting sick right now with no real idea of what to do except get your four tests from Biden and hope they come back negative. This lack of basic research and information on who is safest in our families to care for others, what treatment to give them when they're sick, and how to care for them to give them the best fighting chance is in my book, a crime. These are health officials, they're scientists, they're doctors. They shouldn't be telling us to just hunker down and hope we never catch it. We need more information. They haven't given it to us. And worse, they've demonized any discussion of it. I want to from the hospital's perspective, they're, as you said, dealing with a fire hose of, of, of problems with unvaccinated patients, and they've got a doctor who refuses to be vaccinated. I think what the hospital should be doing is, is actually the same thing they were doing when this pandemic first started, which is to support anybody willing to risk their life to come in and to provide care for patients who are needing help. If the numbers are showing that unvaccinated people are appearing in your hospital far more than the vaccinated ones. What's the problem with vaccines? I'm not here to say that I'm against vaccines, okay? That's one thing I wanna make perfectly clear. Nowhere have I ever said, don't get the vaccine. Building this barn for the last five years, I think. Just not for him. 
At 63 and fit, Redwood believes he's far less likely to get seriously ill from COVID because he has no comorbidities like most of the patients he's seen. He also says he wears a mask outside the house, although not everywhere, doesn't shake hands or get too close to others. When I'm at the hospital, I wear a mask in front of every patient encounter the entire time I'm in the hospital. Do your patients know you're not vaccinated? That's not something I share, no. Why? And do you think, do you think maybe they would want to know that? If they want to know, they're free to ask. A lot of the patients I see, you've got to remember, are coming in because they haven't been vaccinated. They're like you. They're like me. And for him, the risk of any possible unknown side effects from the COVID shot outweighs any proven benefit especially now that the vaccines require boosters. So you think in your personal situation, getting the virus is less dangerous than getting the vaccine? No, what I'm saying is I don't want to get either one. Life-threatening complications are very rare. Um, I have, in my own practice, I have admitted a number of children to the hospital with COVID-19 and COVID-19 uh, complications. I have yet to admit a patient to the hospital with a serious vaccine side effect. Dr. Cameron Sultan is a pediatric ER doctor and the secretary treasurer of the Georgia College of Emergency Physicians. Redwood is one of their members. The group endorses vaccine mandates for healthcare workers because it means an additional layer of protection for both them and the patient. You know, if that is Piedmont's uh, policy, then um, I think it, it, it should be followed. Piedmont Healthcare had no comment about Redwood's firing or whether the mandate has affected already difficult staffing levels, only calling employee loss minimal. Redwood said he offered to be tested weekly, but got no response. He says he's only taken one COVID test so far, and it was negative. The FDA says all three vaccines are safe, effective, and proving to be the difference maker in saving lives. That vaccine is keeping people from getting severe disease. I will agree with that. It's too soon to know what long-term implications this vaccine could have. When will we know whether you're wrong or you were right? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Perhaps once the list of possible side effects reported by the public is fully investigated, rather than immediately used to push the anti-vax agenda. So far, nearly two thirds of our country, 215 million Americans have received at least one shot. You're getting it all. Redwood won't be stuck at home for long. He's already landed another job, practicing emergency medicine in Alabama at a hospital without a vaccine mandate. The people there seem to appreciate me when I'm there. They're not asking me about my vaccine status. They know I'm there to help them. They know I'm wearing a mask uh, and they welcome my presence. navigate all this craziness and my publicist Wayne Dolcefino for also helping me stand up against all the media outrage. Um, so two months ago in November, uh, Houston Methodist launched me into the public spotlight by uh, telling the world that they were suspending my privileges for supposedly spreading dangerous misinformation about COVID. Um, so, and uh, <coughs> Houston Chronicle joined in in that effort. And um, since then, um, I've had a lot of people publicly uh, comment that I should lose my license. These people don't know me, they're strangers. One of the people in particular, Ariana Garcia, is a journalist for the Houston Chronicle. And three days ago, she published a story entitled it, Former Houston Methodist Doctor Still Has Her License Despite Continuing to Spread COVID-19 Misinformation. Shame on her. Shame, Shame, Shame on her. her. Shame on her. Ariana does not know me. Hashtag not journalist. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Ariana does not know me. She never bothered to ask me to comment on this article before she published it. And neither do any of the other people who have called for my license to be uh, removed. So I want to tell y'all what it takes to be, get into this spot right here. And it's not an easy journey. It's not easy to get a medical license. It took, my path took 13 years of higher education. I had to make straight A's. Residency was a 
five hardest years of my life, mentally, physically, emotionally. But I did learn a lot, and one of my most valuable lessons was to take a critical view of pharmaceutical companies and not be the first person to prescribe the newest and latest drug until it has stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> and that has served me well when looking at COVID-19 and how we're treating it. I also, one of my favorite attendees at Stanford, um, <clears throat> he told me that um, we need to uh, be wary of any new vaccines that come out and not to follow the herd, to, be, right. to take things yes. with a critical view. I also learned about the culture of these big academic institutions. And they're rigid, they're hierarchical, and they breed conformity. And I knew that after residency, that was not the kind of practice I wanted to be surrounded in. Thank God. <laughs> so, um, in the following years, I had kids, and that experience gave me a different perspective on the doctor-patient relationship. I had four boys in five years, uh, so I was basically, <laughs> I was a patient for five years straight, <laughs> and that was eye-opening. I learned what an um, inefficient, uh, impersonal, confusing healthcare system we have. And when I started this clinic, I was determined to do things differently. I have no financial ties with any third parties. I do not contract with insurance companies. I don't contract with the government. I do not take Medicare. I have no financial ties with hospitals and no financial ties with pharmaceutical companies. Thank you guys. Yeah. I work for are my patients and I treat them the way I would want to be treated. Thank you. I'm also a strong believer in transparency and I list all my prices on my website and I list all my clinical data on my website. My ENT and sleep medicine practice morphed into this COVID center in response to my patients' needs and wants. Um, I, um, to date, or actually in the last six months even, I have treated over 2,000 people successfully um, as outpatients for COVID. And I want to... here today who is just now recovering from COVID and if she had taken the traditional route she would be in the hospital or worse right now and thank you so much and you know unfortunately we don't have monoclonal antibodies so I was able to treat her despite that I gave her high dose uh, IV steroids I gave her high dose IV vitamin C I gave her other vitamins um, and I gave her high dose ivermectin. She said, you, you want me to take 20 of those? I said, yes. <laughs> and then we laughed about how hard it is to get it out of the package, but she did it. Um, and you know, we did that for several days in a row. And then this past weekend, she was able to stay home and rest. And, and here she is today doing great. COVID treatment works, it saves lives, save lives, and I'm not going to be silenced, intimidated, or bullied by Houston Methodist, Houston Chronicle, or any anyone else who wants to target physicians that question the narrative. been hijacked and hijacked by hospitals, big pharma, insurance companies, and the federal agencies. Doctors, this is our time. We need to stand up and save our profession. And, and patients, ask yourself, do you want doctors 
that respect your right to informed consent and respect your right to try? Or do you want those that follow the dictates of hospitals, insurance companies, and federal agencies? No. <clears throat> Media companies um, and the bullying of physicians that don't follow the narrative in hospitals and governments that are unwilling to share important data about the vaccines and about COVID treatments have bred mistrust amongst the public. Yes. Yes. Right. Methodist Hospital is part of this problem. They have chosen secrecy over transparency. They have listed on their website two of their key core values are integrity and accountability yet they won't share their data with us. The <clears throat> Freedom of Information Act and the Texas Business Code require nonprofits at Methodist Hospital to reveal their data. Uh, I have made formal requests and received nothing. But we have lots of questions. We want to know, of all the million plus people that you have vaccinated, how many of those have had an adverse reaction? And what are they? Yes. 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 The highest number ever. Why is a child too asking these questions? Exactly. Um, and then of all the people who have recently, recently been admitted with COVID, how many of those people are fully vaccinated? How many of your fully vaccinated employees are having breakthrough cases? And of the 2,879 patients that have died in your hospitals, how many of them were refused early treatment? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Financially, we have a lot of questions. In 2019, Methodist Hospital reported over $4 billion in assets. This was before COVID. Let's see what they've done since COVID. How much have your uh, executives profited from the COVID windfall? Do you have any financial relationships with the vaccine companies? Do you, <clears throat> how much are you making from the vaccines? How much have you been rewarded by giving remdesivir? And what have your complications been from giving remdesivir? Because they have not responded to my request for information, I decided to take legal action against Methodists. I'm not seeking any financial gains from this or personal gain. I'm simply seeking the truth, which we all deserve. College had me stressing. So Father, grant me blessings. Path I'm on is lonely, so right now just help me feel your presence. Give me royal bars with the humility of mortal peasants. Pray that every elder stand for lesson. Call me Lauren as I stand on this hill. I begin to survey the field. I wonder just how far I'll get without a deal. Cause anything I say is real and any line I spit is facts. And any dream I have is valid, so I'm never going back. Shit. Listen to that voice inside. That is where the choice resides. You write the future, you know where it lies. I proceed, judgment is anger's disguise. Taking a risk will always yield a prize. People will tell us to follow our heart and then look at us crazy when we live our lives. My mom, it's not for dad. All the support is that I ever had. It's for the principal of my high school who said I would be nothing, but look where I'm at. Won't stop till I ain't got to look at the text. We go out to eat and I pick up the tap, took a leap on my dream. Now it's all I can see. I'm enjoying the scene and I'm not looking back. Shit.